everybody and welcome to the Pineapple Podcast, a Cherry Creek Innovation Campus production and we're your hosts. My name is Morgan Dawson. And I'm Nate Barrett. Today's guest is widely known as the Ace Hardware Chef. He studied at Johnson & Wales University and has over 20 years experience as an executive chef. His experiences have led him to be the owner of 5280 Culinary, a one-stop shop for all your consulting and spicing needs. Welcome, Chef Jason Morse. Hey, good morning. How are you guys today? Great. Good, how are you? Good, good. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Absolutely. Well, thanks for joining us. I would love if you could start us off telling, your, telling us a little bit about yourself and your, and your experience in the industry. Sure. I, uh, you know, I've been fortunate. I'm one of those people that have known uh, ever since I was little what I wanted to do with my career and what I wanted to do for a job. So ever since I was a little kid, I always knew I wanted to be a chef. Uh, I, I love food. I think uh, it's just the biggest passion I have in life. They say uh, food is food is passion, food is life. And, and I really believe that. Um, you know, I've been fortunate to cook um, in a lot of great restaurants and, and kind of what started me off with my desire for more education, more training, et cetera, was I was a DECA student in high school. Um, and I participated in DECA. I had an absolute blast with that. I uh, was fortunate to be in the work program or work study program where I went to school uh, from seven o'clock until about 11 o'clock every morning and then uh, went to work. So I would work as a busboy uh, at the local restaurant, busing tables and, and doing all that. And then moved into cooking at night where I could do a little prep work. Uh, but the downtime in between those jobs gave me an opportunity to get my homework done. Um, and I was very fortunate to have great mentors growing up uh, and I still talk to them all to this day. I'm very good friends with them. Um, and they just, you know, they took a, a vested interest in me and really helped me, guide me and steer me. Uh, and then I just continued to, you know, progress and make different steps and job changes that led me to, you know, going to school in Johnson and Wales in Charleston. Um, had just an absolute blast. School was so, was amazing. Um, I learned a lot about myself. I think I learned, you know, a ton about culinary, but I really learned how to be self-sufficient, um, how to, uh, you know, dig myself into an issue and dig myself out of an issue. Um, but school was dynamite, really um, instilled in me and reminded me why I love this culinary world so much. Uh, and then, you know, my career has taken me to Wow, South Carolina, Georgia, Minneapolis, where I'm from, uh, Colorado, where I've been for the last 20 some years. Um, I was fortunate to become an executive chef at age 30, um, which was really awesome. Uh, and just ran some, some fun restaurants, some big restaurants and hotels, country clubs, and, uh, you know, decided I wanted to work harder uh, for myself. So we started our 5280 Culinary uh, business, doing a lot of consulting, uh, working on our own line of retail barbecue products uh, that we proudly sell at Ace Hardware stores across the nation. Uh, and I'm the national spokesperson now for Ace Hardware. I'm their chef. Uh, I get to do all their recipes, videos, satellite media tours, all that kind of fun stuff. And I'll tell you, it's, it's interesting thinking a life in the kitchen led you to a life uh, as a chef for a hardware store company, but it's mm -hmm. super cool. Uh, it's really fun. And it's been, um, and I always say the jobs I had led me to the job I got, which led me to the place I'm at. And I really believe that I, I've been able to pull experiences from restaurants, country clubs, hotels, uh, fine dining, et cetera, that led me to use those skills. Now, uh, what I do day to day for Ace Hardware. Did you know you wanted to own your own business when you were starting out or was that something that you, you decided on later on in life? I never knew. It's, that's such a great question. Um, no, I never knew. And I joke like, why didn't I know this 30 years ago when, you know, we could have, we could have um, impacted our future differently and, and tried to get in on some things. Um, yeah. What a great question. I didn't know. Right. I, 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 I don't want to say I fell into my business, but the business just, it was a weird natural transition where um, I was working in the country club, doing some consulting on the side. And all of a sudden, you know, I, I have a check like a Christmas bonus from the country club. And I wanted to like seed my business and I'm at the bank talking to a business banker. And before I know it, we're searching for the, the name of our business. And I'm like 5280 food, 5280 culinary. Boom. I mean, that's it. It really happened just like that. Um, and I'll tell you what, what a great, it, it's been such a good adventure, right? I've made, I've made a ton of mistakes. 
there's things I look back on and I'm like, man, why did I do that? Uh, I ask a lot more questions now. I'm fortunate to have a lot of mentors that I still talk to today and, and pick their brain. I mean, I just love being around brilliant minded people that know business. So um, I didn't know I wanted to be a business owner. Now I I love it. Like I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. There's a ton of risk, right? Uh, but I feel like the reward is much, much greater than the risk. Nice. Absolutely. That's awesome to hear from you, like how you started out and how you're here now and you had no idea that it was going to go this way. Like I'm sure you had no idea that you would travel everywhere and become, you know, the ace hardware chef. Like, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, you know, there's times where <clears throat> my wife and I will, you know, be sitting somewhere and, and having dinner or something or talking and yeah. she's, she, we always joke, like, did you ever think, like, no, who would have said when you were little, like, I want to do a career progression and I want to go here, 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 here and end up at a hardware store. You know, we, we help kind of create that niche within the Ace Hardware system for what I do for them and, it, and it's been very beautiful um, just to see that grow over the course of the last four years to become kind of a, we have, we're feeling each other out. Like, why are we doing this? Why do, why do I want to work with you? Why are you working with me? And then all of a sudden we find more opportunities to partner together, to match up. And now, I mean, it's just, it's explosive growth over the last couple of years in what we offer, but it's so great because it's forced me to be adaptable um, and to pivot and to shift. And then especially in the coronavirus time, um, yeah. you know, we, what we do is in hardware store parking lots, right? We, we do demonstrations, cooking events, classes where we're talking to consumers and we're, you know, live and, and, and in their space and they're in our space. And now we've moved it virtual. So we've had to adapt our business um, with technology to become more virtual. And we've been able to keep up with the demands of what our customers need, which has been, pretty solid. Yeah, I remember we did, you were a guest speaker when we first got out of school last <laughs> March. I can't believe it's almost a year. That's crazy to me. When but I, set I the, remember, when I set the yeah, fire alarm off in happened. my kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> I know. And you said, you said you were talking about how all the culinary shows on the Food Network were transitioning to the same online format and just seeing, I think it was not Bobby Fillet. Maybe. I Michael think it Simon. might have been. Michael Simon. They, Michael Simon. I thought they had like people send food across the country and then they'd show him how to make it. Yep. And that was one thing I definitely checked out after talking to you. And is that what your online setup is kind of like now? Yeah, we've, man, we've grown. Our online stuff has grown just huge. I mean, we went from, you know, just using our iPhone as our primary camera to, you know, we've got two different sets of wireless mics. We've got multiple GoPros that we can plug into our laptop to do, you know, I'm doing a, a Zoom cooking class, a virtual cooking class this weekend. And we'll actually have three cameras set up. We'll have the iPhone for the main camera, and then we'll have two GoPros set up for camera one, camera two kind of deal. Um, and it's just crazy. I mean, being able to uh, pull off these virtual classes where people still feel like they're part of it is just amazing. We're doing another one tomorrow night for the FFA, the Colorado FFA Foundation, where it's a live virtual cooking class. Um, it's been interesting. I almost feel, you know, I almost feel like it's more intimate. You get those 15 to 20 people yeah. that, or, or more, 25 that sign up for this class, and they are one on one with you. Uh, they have the opportunity to ask questions, type messages in the chat. Um, but yeah, we've really, we've focused um, hard on switching to that. And you know, it's interesting on the consulting side, our customers and clients that we have, um, we've adapted to do that for them. So we're creating more video content for them, more online content. I just made a, um, a time-lapse video of pizza making on the Uni pizza oven on how to use Thanksgiving leftovers uh, as a way to get that out ahead of Thanksgiving to help Uni with some of the promotions. And, you know, it really starts with a, a collaboration session of here's what we want to me thinking, well, here's what we can do. Here's what we can offer to coming together, agreeing on it. And then I get to work and do my thing. We send that video out for you know uh, review to make sure everybody likes it we adjust it accordingly and literally within three days we go from concept to content uh and it's really cool just to see how fast that happens 
Because, you know, a lot of places send it out to these big companies that, that take weeks, weeks to edit videos and get you your content back. And we're able to do it now, literally and almost in real time. Yeah. yeah, I think that speaks so much to you as a person and, and your company that even though in something so negative, such, such as the COVID-19 pandemic, you guys have really found a niche and you've prevailed through it and found this so many positive things and built your online platform. I think that's so awesome. And I think, you know, that's the positivity we need and right now. Yeah, and the cool, you know, when you asked about did I ever think I'd be here? I think learning what I learned along the way and starting my business and having to constantly adapt and change because, it, you know, when you work for someone else, you follow their structure and their path and their growth plans. Um, and you know that it, you're going to work hard. Unfortunately, a lot of times that's for the betterment of the company you work for. When you own your own business, the more I hustle, the better it helps us. So mm -hmm. being able to adapt and change and overcome uh, fast really allows you to keep your company growing and moving. I mean, could I have sat there and said, I'm going to wait for stimulus and wait for the government hand, not handout, but the government um, assistance and, and unemployment and that kind of stuff. Yeah, I could have, but you know, I, that's not how I roll. I, I want to be out there doing what we can do. And you know, if our, if our customers are at home, I want to get them at home, where they live, where they eat, where they sleep, where they sit, where they watch TV. We want to create that content. So, and See, that's such a good way to think about it, too, because it's so you making it accessible for these people mm -hmm. at home where they're actually eating and cooking and doing all their stuff and that you're really hitting that market. I think that's really going to pay off big for you, especially in the future, you know, even when things go back to normal. Yeah, because, you know, I think there's some part-time content creators that got out there right now and they're out on YouTube and Instagram doing their part-time content creating and they're just kind of throwing a bunch of stuff at the wall to see what sticks. We, we, we're doing it very calculated. We have systems. We, have, we look at search engine optimization. We look at what people are searching for, what's trending, what do they want to learn how to cook. Uh, and then we're able to deliver that continuously. So, um, I mean, we're even building a studio now. I'm building, a, a, getting a warehouse and building a studio inside that warehouse to be prepared for next year because I'm going to hit the ground running. We're going to hit it in January and we're going to be able to produce better content, more content, more consistent, um, and really just continue to elevate our game, which is, you know, yes, we make good content. I just, I can't wait to do it even better. Wow. Uh, yeah, hitting the ground in running, I, I, I'd say that's a, a good way to put it for sure. You definitely got some good people around you that really know what they're doing and really know how to, how to make this right. And the fact that you said search engine optimization, like <laughs> that just hits That we learned me. about last year. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, I think that's so awesome. Yeah, and that's the cool part of being Allison, who I work with at Ace Corporate, really dials in that SEO to see, you know, uh, hot cocoa bombs. That's the coolest, hippest, hottest thing that everybody's making. <laughs> and we, we made a, a YouTube video on how to make cocoa bombs. Um, and for us, for our performance, uh, it's been doing really well performing without any, we're not putting money behind it. We don't put paid money behind a lot of these videos because we want that organic uh, organic participation. We want organic watches and views. You know, I don't, anytime you put paid behind it, it if you scroll past it slow enough, boom, it's a view. I want people watching it. Um, so it's really fun just to see how that search engine optimization comes into play and how quickly, I mean, I, she could, I make, we shoot content usually every Tuesday or Wednesday. We edit it and it goes live on Thursday. We can literally adapt week by week to catch whatever's coming out that people want so we can be ahead of it or be a part of it. Yeah, absolutely. So great. And everybody's online now. So yeah. it's like every trend they see, they're like, they've got nothing else to do because they're going to work or they're going to school and then they're going home. So they're just constantly trying to find stuff to do, especially in the beginning of quarantine. Yeah, that everybody was just so bored. I went through a reading phase. I hated reading before that, but it was just something to do. And a lot of people started cooking as well. So yep. the fact that you're in this industry and you're helping people during a time when 
they're realizing they need to start helping themselves with learning how to cook and a lot of other things. I think that's a very um, high position that you can help people from home. Yeah. yeah. Well, even, I mean, think about it. How often do the three of us were like, how do I do this? Ah, let me search it on YouTube or let me Google it. And it could be anything. How do I change my tire? How do I change my oil? Um, we even created how to videos on grill maintenance, how to clean your grills, how to deep clean, how to change gaskets. We have a video, which just cracks me up to this day. We made a video how to clean the Traeger and it is me cleaning a grill, vacuuming it out with a shop vac. We have like almost 300,000 views and, and it makes me chuckle. I sit there like 300,000 people have watched me vacuum out a grill. I'm like, how cool is, who would have ever thought, right? How cool is that? But it's just so nice to be able to create that content that is what people want. We're not just throwing stuff against the wall. We're not shooting all these videos of cutting meat. We're doing actual cooking things. We're being helpful, uh, which is the main point of what we are helpful. Do you think it takes like a special gift in order to succeed in your industry or specifically in your job where you're talking to people or you're, you're in the public eye all the time? Do you think that's something you're born with personality wise or do you think there is a lot of work you can put into it to excel in that I would, in the, yeah i would say both i think personality is huge everybody wants that big big bold personality um and and it's not obnoxious but you have to have a presence um you have to have that look that feel that um you know kind of that persona so i think that comes naturally I, I, i've always kind of been a character so to speak, when it comes to that, I'm, I'm, I'm jovial. I love to joke, have fun, mess around, that kind of stuff. Um, fortunately, I've been put in positions where they have, the companies I've worked for have wanted me to do that, have wanted me to be out in the public eye. So I've had media training. Uh, I've done training where, um, you know, I'm, I'm learning how to speak on air in a news studio, where I'm learning how to do satellite media tours, uh, just a lot of different things. So I, the, to be good, to be natural is one thing, but to be good is a lot of hard work. I mean, it really helps shape your skills and learning talking points, when to have a natural pause, when to stop. Um, yeah. You know, and, you know, one of the biggest things was learning if I was ever on live TV and they throw that curveball question at you, how not to be, you know, on live TV, like, huh, like, what? Pausing. Yeah, it's just, yeah. you know, there's a lot of finesse that goes behind that. And I would say anything you want to be successful at, you're going to have to put in a lot of work. Yeah. No matter what, whether you're doing media, whether it's your own business, whether you're a manager, an employee at another uh, uh, company, anything, that you want to obtain, you're gonna to have to work hard for it. And I think that's the difference between um, super successful people and moderately successful people. I think super successful people have found ways to, to violate that niche and really work hard to obtain their goals, so. Absolutely. <laughs> And so I would say that, you know, there's two types of people. There's people that say, well, well, the hospitality industry isn't for me because I could never, you know, do service. And there's people who, who enjoy it. I mean, I know plenty of people, especially how I was in food service, that they wouldn't trade it for the world. So what would you say, what comes into that? What makes you built for food service or the hospitality industry in general? You know, like, you, you have to be a little bit crazy, right? Mm, absolutely. You have to, and I mean yeah. crazy, like I thrive on what I do in the hospitality industry. I thrive on events. I thrive on big things. I thrive on the logistics behind planning a national grill tour behind, you know, last July, we traveled for the, almost the entire month of July to different stores. And it was learning how to plot out, you know, that logistics behind that when you're traveling from Colorado to Kansas, Nebraska, Wyoming, um, uh, Minnesota, Illinois, uh, South Dakota, Wisconsin, the logistics are insane. I mean, most people would be like, I'm good. Um, and that's a lot like planning prep for a big event in a hotel. I mean, you have to, you have to appreciate the beauty behind 
the prep. I mean, I really think the prep of getting events set is just fantastic and organizing things. So everything flows and fires and is orchestrated and choreographed. You have to be a dork for details because the details are what kill you. If you do it right, you're, you're a legend. If you miss a couple details, it's not a good day. I mean, you're only as good as the last plate you served mm -hmm. and every plate should be like the first plate you served. Just yeah. beautiful and flawless. Um, is the hospitality industry for everyone? Absolutely not. I think there's a lot of soul searching you need to do and a lot of question asking. Um, what am I willing to do to advance my career? Um, how, yeah. how hard do I want to work to get where I'm at? I, I left Johnson & Wales Culinary School with $60,000 in debt, making $21,000 a year. I yeah. went into school making $19,000 a year. Mm -hmm. So I got a $2,000 raise. And at the time I was like, oh, this is, um, this is great. <laughs> but <clears throat> you had to almost start modeling your career path to say, how am I going to get from sous chef to executive sous to yeah. executive chef? And then picking the places you want to work. It's not, again, you have to be calculated. You, you know, yeah. if you want to be successful, you've got to be calculated. You can't just, ah, this job is hard. I'm going to go work someone else, somewhere else. Um, the, I just, I think the culinary world is, world is beautiful. I really do. I enjoy it. It's very difficult. Um, there's high demand, you, you know, you, there's stress, there's holidays, there's weekends, there's nights, you know, when your friends are out playing, you are working. Yeah. Um, but if you have that love and that passion for culinary, that's the stuff that feeds your love and passion. Yeah, there's definitely something different about it, I would say, because it's very serious work at times, but it's also extremely rewarding in, in a way that I couldn't exactly explain, to be honest, but it's just, you know, to see everything come together or to see that you make somebody's day, it, that's what makes it all worth it, those hard hours and those, those serious, stressful times. But that's when, you know, people in the hospitality and with that niche, that's when they thrive is on that, under that pressure, I find. And that's, you know, what makes it a good industry for them. Yeah. And imagine someone comes into your hotel, your restaurant, your country club, yeah. and you're doing their wedding. The single most important day of someone's yeah. life is now thrust on your shoulders. Uh, your team has to fire on all cylinders. Um, they have to be flawless in their execution. The food has to be exactly how you showed them in the test meal. I mean, there's just so many variables. When, when we were super busy in the country club and it was golf season, I, you know, I had airborne in, in piles in the kitchen. So I kept my guys healthy. We kept them uh, vitamined up. We made sure, you know, constant reminders like eat, drink water, make sure you guys get rest. When you have your two days off, the first day off is when you go out and do whatever you want. The second yeah. day, chillax, relax, sit at home, rebuild, regenerate, um, you know, and knock on wood. We never had a wedding that didn't go off perfectly because you constantly sit down and you plan and you rehearse and you plan and you rehearse. And then before the event, you're walking through it again. You have lots of meetings. It's not just the chef. There is an entire team. It's the servers. It's the restaurant managers. It's outlet managers. It's banquet manager. It's sous chefs. It's line cooks. It's everybody getting together to say, this is the war plan today. And here's the <laughs> battle plan. Like we're, this is how we're going to get through this. And you, you know, everyone is as important in that team as the chef is. And the chef's the, the general a lot of times that says, this is how we're going to win today. Um, but I'll tell you what, man, pulling off a wedding and you're always nervous. I mean, if you're not nervous before events, something is wrong. You know, mm -hmm. like it, it, that nerve means you care. So pulling off a wedding and peeking your head out the door to make contact, eye contact with the bride and the groom mm -hmm. and the parents and everybody's like thumbs up. You're like, oh. yeah. that is what you wait for. That is what you're looking for. That's, the world. Your, yeah. Yeah, That's your validation. Exactly. That's your validation that like you did it. You rocked it. Yeah. Well, and something you said in there really jived with me because you, it's very progressive, especially as a executive chef that you said, you know, you're making sure that your employees are 
you know, mentally and physically ready for those things. You know, they got those two days off. You want them to chillax the second day, do whatever they want on the first day. I think that's really progressing. I, progressing. I think that's lost in a lot of ways. And with other executive chefs and people in the industry that, you know, they don't really think about how important it is to make sure that your team is there. You know, you can be there, but at the end of the day, you really need to rely on your team and you really need to push those those things like physical and mental health for your whole entire team. And I think that's awesome that you really touched on that. One of the things we, one of the things that, that hit home with me always um, for many, many years is Walt Disney had a, had a hiring practice that they called Mm -hmm. casting. They would cast their talent. So they knew what positions they needed to fill. And when they hired people, they looked for people that they could cast into that position. It didn't mean they had to know it exactly, but they looked for something that told them that that person would be cast for that perfect position within Disney. And I always felt that when I talked to line cooks and sous chefs and things, I I didn't necessarily care if the guy had 20 years of experience, but I looked Mm -hmm. for something in that person that was that spark, was that, that firework that went off that was like, ooh, they are gonna fit this role really, really well. So we would give people opportunities to grow into their role, knowing that we had a lot of work to do on the training side and the follow-up side and the commitment. Um, and that's kind of how we always worked. It was, it was helping, helping people get that step up and giving them that opportunity, but also providing them a lot of training and a lot of feedback. Um, and that's, you know, I, I was never a chef that hired a body. I didn't want a warm body. Yeah. I would rather us uh, elevate our game and take care of what we needed to take care of versus plugging someone in a hole just for the sake of saying, whew. Um, a little bit to not sort of switch the conversation, but you talked about hardworking people and like when you're looking for people to put into these positions, somebody with a spark. And once they start working, is it, the work ethic that you're really looking for? I'm looking for drive and passion. Yeah. Like I interviewed um, a guy and we were talking about art and passion and food. And he was talking about building models and he kept going on with, oh yeah, I, you know, I take three boxes and get parts from all three to build one like super mod. And he was talking about building car models and how we can modify the body parts and this and that. But I just, I, I just said to him, like, tell me about one of your hobbies and why you love it so much. Mm-hmm. And he went on and I thought, man, if I can bring that spark out and that passion, you know, in the culinary side, this guy's going to do fantastic. And he mm-hmm. just did wonderful. I mean, absolutely wonderful. And, you know, when I interview too, I let him know, like, this is going to be hard work. It's, it's, it is what it is. Um, we, we work when they play was our country club motto. You know, we worked in the kitchen when they were out playing golf. Um, and it was just reminding them that. So in the, in the get go, you know, you, you get what you get walking in the front door, right? So when you apply for your job and you get hired, you get what you get the first day, you know, what's coming. We let them know that. And then we, you know, found ways to spark their passion, whether it was, if you're a guy that loves to build models, I want you out building the displays for all of our holiday events and, and just finding ways to be creative uh, and keep people engaged in their passion. Yeah, for sure. And I think that's, that also hits home for me for sure. Cause I've, I've hired a uh, plenty of people and you know, the first month is, is great from them. But then you really start to see, you know, what kind of employee they're going to be, you know, going into it a little more, you know, you'll see that they either start falling off or they keep that work ethic up. And I think that that absolutely does come into play with the passion that you're talking about and that drive that they have. And especially, you know, for their hobbies or something that they're really interested in. I love that you said bringing that to light. So I used to be involved in photography business. And I had to, I had to hire a, a, you know, a good a number of people. Let's say I, I've gone. So, uh, and that was interesting because I found that it was either people liked the idea of photography, or they were really passionate in the art of it. 
And I found that those people with the passion for the art really came through for me. And those people who liked just the idea of it and, you know, oh, well, I get to travel and, you know, National Geographic photographer, I was like, well, that's not exactly how it turns yeah. out at first, you know. Yeah. And, I, and I love that you said that, especially, you know, especially as a business owner and executive chef, you know, when you're bringing somebody on, you look for that drive and that passion. I think that's awesome for other people to hear about. Yeah. yeah. You know, the photography part is wonderful. If I had someone in an interview talking about photography and how they frame up stuff and if, and if they were talking about animal photography or sports photography, two different disciplines. And then all of a sudden, if they started talking about architecture photography, now I'm even more peaked because they know how to set things up and they know depth of field and they know what they're looking for. And I'm thinking, how would you shoot pictures of food plates? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, we all have the best camera in the world <laughs> in our hand and a phone. So, you know, I'm listening to them talk about photography, like, huh, I may put you in charge of shooting all of our food photos and doing all of our plate layouts to make sure they look beautiful for the members. Absolutely. And all of a sudden that brand new cook is like, I'm in charge of plate design. Uh huh. Yep. Yeah. I want yeah. you to pick, I want you to figure this out and let's work together as a team, but I want you to take the lead. And all of a sudden after that one month, I'm continuing to drive their drive and keep pushing them. And they're going home thinking, I've been here for a month and these guys have me doing all the plate design and plate layout. That's one of the things I really love about the hospitality industry that I honestly never really thought about before joining the hospitality program at CCIC was you could have so many different backgrounds and so many things under your belt that you could put towards the hospitality and culinary mm -hmm. industry that you may not have thought you were capable of putting into the industry just because there's not something specific like uh, architect photographer, but they know the angles, they know all this little stuff. So you could put them in a position that they can excel in. And that goes for a lot of different positions in the industry too. Yeah, and it's just feeding, feeding people's passions. It's getting them to enjoy that no day is the same. Every day is different. And it's just helping them understand how to embrace that, how to thrive on that, and really how to just absolutely rock coming to work every day, knowing today's different than yesterday, tomorrow's going to be different than today, but how does today help impact how tomorrow goes? Um, yeah. It's a cool, like I said, it's a cool, cool dance that, is just like at the end of the day, you're like, wow, this is, can't believe what we pulled off today. I know. Absolutely. It's kind of like a puzzle. You put all the little pieces together yeah. and then you come out with this yep. big picture. <laughs> and it's like the- oh, it's Friday totally Friday. Right. Think about it. It's, it's built, you know, sometimes you're building the puzzle Tuesday to finish mm -hmm. it Wednesday, which is yeah. great, right? You start building the puzzle and laying that foundation mm -hmm. so that Wednesday, you just have to put a couple pieces in place. Yeah. And that's how great leaders are teaching their team to build a puzzle ahead of time. Otherwise you're building the puzzle like today for today, which yeah. is stressful because that, that it's so, like racks your brain that you have no prep time. You have no way to ease into it. But now all of a sudden I'm building the puzzle today for tomorrow. I've half the puzzle done. I go home thinking, okay, tomorrow I've got the border done. I have half the puzzle. I need to find all the tree pieces but you yeah. go home rehearsing that in your head. Excuse me, you come back the next day and all of a sudden puzzle's done. What are we doing next? So good analogy. Yeah, I think, I think that goes a lot towards us building the podcast because um, this is our senior year. There's been a lot of challenges, a lot of stuff we never even dreamed of, you know? And I think doing these podcasts and putting all these little pieces together. Um, yet when we started doing this podcast, we really thought we were doing good. We didn't really have a date to go back online set in our heads yet up until like two weeks ago. That's when, that's when Miss Dunleavy was really like, oh yeah, we have to start preparing. So we were like, oh no, our podcast. Cause in our classroom at CCIC, yep. we've got this big pineapple and we've got this cool desk and we're like six feet apart. But I think doing this and transitioning because we did all the little steps beforehand and um we you know 
research podcasts and all this stuff and filming and, you know, dress nice, even if you can't see your bottom half, like if you're wearing yeah. pajama pants yeah. or something. Right. Nice back. <laughs> I think, um, I think this, ha- that has really helped us out now because when we logged on, we were just like, okay, you're doing the intro. Okay, let's do this. Perfect. Boom. Let's go. And we're good because we practiced the intro. I think that's the thing we practiced the most. We definitely yeah. had trouble. Yep. Yeah. Um, one of the things, that's the more scripted part one of the yeah. things we always do too is if i'm doing i did a lot i did a um, shot some video content yesterday with one of our local eight stores and we had a run of show and i sent them that run of show ahead of time to basically say hey here's the intro here's what you're going to say i'm going to say or what we're going to talk about here's the estimated time here's you know uh the five segments we're going to shoot what we're going to talk about estimated time and then here's the outro just to give them that anticipated run of show to help organize everything. And I, when I got to the store yesterday, I got all set up. I got my Mise Plus done. I got everything set for my food part. Um, Sam came out and she's like, dude, thank you for the run of show. It was so nice to just like yeah. rehearse that in my head and know exactly how it was going to flow. And I said, okay, we're going to start at 1130, but I was done at 1015 getting set up. And I said, hey, you want to start early? We started early and finished at 1130. Nice. So we were able to go from, you know, 1015-ish or so until 1130 and everything flowed nice and we got it done. So yeah, you definitely, we built the puzzle ahead of time and then just put the last few pieces in and yeah. it works. It works so perfect and, you know, rehearse it, rehearse it. And then as you go through this and you do more podcasts, what do you, you know, what do you want to learn? What do you, or what can you do better? Or, you know, uh, you know, look at my background. Is it too busy? Is it distracting from your, the viewers, you know, um, continually, I think critique what you're doing and have other people critique it. And then know that that criticism is in the spirit of being better. You know, a lot of people get very, very sensitive when they get criticized or get critique back or feedback because, we're so passionate about what we're doing. We're like, well, how dare you give me feedback? It's hard to mess uh, up and it's hard to hear that you messed up for some people. It, one, of the, one of the guys at Ace um, Corporate was talking to me the other day and he's like, what I love about you is you're willing to do anything. And if we give you feedback, you find ways to adapt or change or fight for what you believe is still right. And then we come out of it, always come out of it better. And he's like, I don't know my, many people that do that. I take the criticism from that well, because again, my goal is to have great content, good videos, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, look at it from a learning standpoint and a betterment standpoint to really how, you know, gosh, if this started off at level five, you know, how do you take it to six to seven to eight to nine to 10? Yeah. And to switch the conversation a little bit yeah. and talking more about uh, myths in the industry, um, do you think workers in the industry tend to be overworked and underpaid in certain parts of the industry? Cause I know that was something we talked about before. Yeah. You know, I follow enough forums on social media to, to see the complaints and to see the gripes. Um, I worked for a chef that, you know, I worked for him for about three and a half years and I started as a breakfast cook. And I kept saying, I want to work uh, pantry. I want to work the hot side. I want to work here. And he's like, relax, relax. <clears throat> All of these are different pay levels. So you've got to do your time here to get me to sign off on it, to get you promoted to that in human resources so I can get you more pay. Um, I don't know. Overworked and underpaid, it, I, I'm, I'm very different in how I think about that. Because again, you get what you get going in, right? Yeah you need to ask all those questions. What am I, what's expected of me? There is so much in the interview process that people are afraid. If I'm interviewing you, I want you interviewing me. Yeah. You know what I mean? I want you asking me questions. Hey, what is it? What's it work? What's it like working here? What's it, what's a, a typical shift? It's, you know, what am I going to expect? I want you asking those questions out of me because then you're going to find out, oh man, this, this guy's freaking crazy. Like this may not be the right place for me. He's going to expect me, wait a minute. He just told me on my two days off, day number one, I can go out and play. Day number two, I should be recovering uh, and getting ready for an, the next five days of work. Yes. A lot of people would be like, don't tell me what to do on my day off. Mm -hmm. I'm doing it as a way to guide you along a path 
to get you elevated in uh, your game. Um, again, I, I was a cook at Chili's making $19,000 a year, went to a hotel making $19,000 a year, went to school at Johnson & Wales, a very wonderful culinary school, came out making 21,000. Job after that was 25,000. Mm -hmm. you, you, you've got to pay your dues. You have yeah. to put in the time. You can't not have a culinary education, expect to be a, a, a foodie hired as an executive chef making a hundred grand a year. It doesn't yeah. work like that. There's not that many positions that pay that. Got you've got to, you've, again, you've got to model your career path. How are you getting to where you want to be? Um, yeah. And along the way, it's ugly and it hurts and it's painful and you cry and you're frustrated and it's crap. And there, and there's days you're like, I want to stab myself in the eye with a pencil. Like, I can't believe this, but yeah. you suck it up, you yeah, handle maybe. it, and then you continually use that job to make your next step into a better job. And it's yeah. not about, if you're a jumper and you jump from job to job to job every six months, you are never going to elevate your salary level. Mm -hmm. There's crap everywhere. Everybody's backyard is crap in it, right? You're going to have to deal with that and learn how to, okay, I'm going to learn from this. I'm going to use this. I'm going to mm -hmm. develop techniques that prevent me from doing that and help guide my employ employees out of that. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, the myth is we get, we're overworked and underpaid. I, I think you could say that anywhere. Yeah, I for sure. It, I, I really do. I honestly do. We we get it a lot in the food and beverage industry because we're a moving target, right? We're a big, big moving target. But mm -hmm. I bet if you asked the postal service, they're overworked and underpaid. I bet oh, if you yeah. asked the garbage man, the garbage company or waste management company, overworked, underpaid. Teachers. I mean, I think that would hit every discipline. You yeah. have to you have to align yourself with a business that you think is going to take care of you, treat you right be, be um, easy when it comes to work hours or, or work with you on work hours and help guide you to where you want to be. If you're taking a job just because the money is nice, there's issues. <clears throat> I took a job once because it was a $12,000 a year salary increase. That's a lot of money. It's $1,000 a month. Um, I now know that was the worst thing to do. And <laughs> if it walks and talks like a duck, it's a duck. Like if, if there's something wrong, if they're offering you that much money, there's, there's something wrong. Yeah. One I'm really interested in is the saying that hospitality is women's work, especially in the kitchen. You know, that's a real traditional thing to say, especially. And I yeah, want to know what your thoughts on that are. Because you've been in, a, in the kitchen a lot. I have. I, I have spent a life in the kitchen. I think it's a sexist thing to say. I think it's um, chauvinistic, you know, I mean, it, it, it's, I'm trying to think of a word to words to use that aren't profanity laden. <laughs> yeah, I understand. Against, I'm still against the whole women belong here, men belong here. Yes. Yeah. It is a male dominated environment. Absolutely. It is. All right. Mm -hmm. But I have worked with some pretty BA females in kitchens that do not put up with crap and can outdo what a lot of people do. Um, yeah. Marina, a girl that I knew when I was a country club chef, they were members, her family was members at the club. Marina always did kids classes with me. I mean, I've known her since she was like eight. Now she's in school at, or a graduate of CIA in Greystone, living in Napa, working for Charlie Palmer. Like I remember talking to Marina and her and her mom saying, what, what do we have up against us? And I said, unfortunately, you're a girl and you're gonna be looked at differently in the kitchens, which, you know, don't go into it thinking I gotta burp and fart and do everything guys do and act crude like guys do. Go into it knowing you're gonna continually have to prove yourself. And I mean, I'm so proud of her because now I, I just sit there like, seriously, you work for Charlie Palmer who has like been a mentor, an idol chef of mine that I've looked up to because he is just so amazing in everything he does. Um, and, you know, she sent me snapshots of um, text messages from her chef and sous chef, totally just being awesome to her. Hey, great job tonight. You killed it. Way to do this. 
Um, it, it's so stupid we still think that way. It really is. Um, in, in all the kitchens I'm at, I was at, I, the, the girls in my kitchens did everything the guys did. It was mm -hmm. no different. You know, it was, it was not like you go do pastry and you go do salads and we'll take care of all the hot stuff because we're guys. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think, again, we have to break those barriers down continuously. And it starts with us as chefs saying mm -hmm. enough, this is crap. Let's stop this BS. And, you know, we're chefs, we're culinarians, we're cooks. I don't care if you're man, woman, elephant, turtle, chicken, you know, we're all yeah. the same. We are all cooks. Yeah. yeah, and as far as you being a chef, I I know we talked about this uh, when we talked in the interview follow-up, but um, you went to school to become a chef. And uh, I wanted to know, when you went into that, did you think you would come out rich like, you know, the stigma is nowadays, especially with, you know, the ce celebrity chef scene? Yeah, there's, there's not many celebrity chefs, right? <laughs> you look at a <laughs> no. Guy Fieri, you look at Guy Fieri, you look at Charlie Palmer, you look at Bobby Flay, there's, there's a handful of those guys, right? And people don't like them. And why don't they like them? Well, the saying is they hate us because they ain't us, <laughs> right? A lot of people don't like them because they've obtained something in their life that a lot of people won't obtain. And it reminds people of faults, failures, uh, things you may not be. Um, you're not gonna come out of school making $100,000 a year. It just doesn't happen. I mean, if, if, if you go to School of Mines or you go to CU Boulder, you go to law school, DU, you, that's a different world because those jobs pay and demand a high level of education, whether it's a master's, a doctorate, whatnot, you've aligned yourself with the school that is gonna provide you the education so that when you come out of that school, you're credentialed and ready to step into that job, making, making really Hopefully. good money, right? Hopefully, yeah. right? depending on the yeah. environment. In the culinary world, you're going to culinary school so that I'm just that much far ahead of the person behind me. Mm -hmm. I've given myself the competitive edge yeah. with experience, with positions I've held prior to school and a culinary education. Mm -hmm. I'm ensuring my spot at the table and I'm hoping I'm going to make a little bit higher than entry level because my uh, background warrants that. Did I expect <clears throat> to come out of school and make a hundred grand a year? No, because fortunately, I worked for chefs that mentored me and gave it to me straight. You are not going to do this. Even when we started selling barbecue products to Ace Hardware, a lot of people think, man, I landed Ace Hardware. I'm going to make millions. It doesn't happen that way. You don't land one Ace Hardware store and then the other 4,000 are lining up at your front door to take your, to your products. You have to build that. Anything worth obtaining is worth working hard for. Yeah. All right. I mean, that's my motto for everything. I'm not afraid to work hard. I've never expected anything. I've never felt I was entitled to it. I was always of, I'm going to go out and get it. I never looked at that guy driving a Ferrari and was like, oh, I can't believe he's got a Ferrari and I don't. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, guess what? If I want a Ferrari, I will align myself with something that gets me to eventually having a Ferrari. Yeah. I and remember. I <laughs> I remember it was like the beginning of when I joined CCIC and I was going home and I was telling my dad's girlfriend, I'm so excited about this class. Like, this is amazing. This, uh, this is what I want to do for college. This is what I want my career to be. And the first thing she said wasn't, oh, I'm so proud of you. Like, that's so cool. She was like, you know, they don't make a lot of money. And I was like, okay, well, that's all right. I'll go to school for it. And I never any career field, not that I thought of one, you know, cause you go through your little career steps and you're like, when I was a kid, I wanted to be an astronaut. And then you yeah. I want to be like a horse trainer or whatever. But I was like, always thinking of myself working hard, going to school, working the little jobs, building myself up. And so I can like, I always see myself planning out my entire life so I can retire comfortably after right. doing a life full of work that I love to do. And the money's not really, not really what drives me, you know? Yeah, work hard. You know, I, I, 
work hard and the money comes. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. If you're continuously worrying about how much you make, how much you make, how much you make, how much you make, being fulfilled doing what you do is so personally rewarding. Being yeah. able to work every day with your hands and create and serve people meals. And I'm in hospitality because I like being in service to people. Yeah. I enjoy that. It is That's rewarding. Awesome. I worried about my job. That's what I worried about. The, the, core, the core responsibilities of my job are what I took care of. And I always knew the money would take care of itself. Do a good job, work hard, and it is eventually going to happen. If you're constantly worried about it happening tomorrow, 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 I need this, I need, you're in it for the wrong reason. Mm -hmm. We are culinarians and we are in hospitality because something feeds our passion. Something mm -hmm. feeds that beautiful thing in us that when you serve a meal to someone or you've just gotten done taking care of their wedding and they send a letter back like, I unbelievable service. You, you sit there like, that's right. <laughs> I mean, to me, there's a reward. Like, yes, yeah. we did it. Like, we killed it. You know, I feel that way. I mean, even now, if I, if I, you know, I left our video shoot yesterday, got the trailer packed up, drove to my office and was like, dude, that was freaking awesome. Like, it went so smooth. I, like, in my mind, I'm celebrating because I'm like, cool. It just reminds me, like, continually keep doing what I do and it, and it works and it, and it fits and it, you know. I remember our yeah. first practice podcast with Layla. We like hung up the, we hung up on the zoom and we looked over at each other and we were like, Oh my goodness. Yeah. Woo. And then he's like, you did good. And I was like, you did good. And it was just such a rewarding feeling. And Mr. That great? was like out too. And you should celebrate that. You yeah. Should celebrate that every time and be like, Whoa, Look what we just pulled off. Look what we just did. And let yeah. that soak in. And then go home and think about, okay, how am I going to do better? Because mm -hmm. when you have that high of, oh, man, we just killed it. That's the yeah. best time to think. Like every time I do a Facebook Live, I do a video, I do a media thing, I go back and watch. After I'm done, like, patting myself on the back, I go back and watch my performance to see what I did, to see how I can do better. And my wife asked me, she's like, do you watch everything you do? I'm like, absolutely. I go back and watch it. And she's yeah. like, why? I'm like, well, I say right a lot, right? Right? Oh, right. I want to, you know, I want to go back and see that so I cannot do that again. So I can be less, so I can be more polished. I'm continually beating my, not beating myself up. I'm continually pushing myself to do better. Right? And that's, I think, you know, enjoy the high, enjoy that like celebration. And then in the same spirit, like, cool, here's what we're going to do better next time because everybody yeah. will look at you like you're nuts they'll be like what are you serious you guys killed it it was so awesome it was amazing you're like we did a great we and again we because it's a whole yeah. team we did a great job but as a team we feel here's what we can do to make it better and then people are going to look at you like oh those those kids are going far yeah right don't um, ever get comfortable i there's a saying that is says i am not as good when i'm comfortable mm-hmm yeah. And I'll find um, you my Walt, I'll find you my Walt Disney saying it's about keep moving forward. It came from the movie Meet the Robinsons. Um, that Disney movie from way back oh, when. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I and know, it's like yeah. around here we keep doing new things and we keep opening new doors because we're adventurous and we love exploring. And it's like, and at the bottom it says, keep moving forward. Walt yeah. Disney. And it's like been one of my, ever since I, my kids were little and we saw that movie, I pulled that as one of my like mantras because mm -hmm. it's true. Keep moving forward. Keep opening new doors. Keep exploring. How did you go from culinary school to hotels and restaurants to private mm -hmm. country clubs to now you call hardware stores your culinary home? <laughs> yeah. You know, so it's adapt, it's create, it's, it's find your, find your path and, and, and make it work. In terms of the future generations, like kids our age, coming into the hospitality culinary industry, what strengths do you think our generation as a whole will bring to the hospitality and culinary industry once we move forward? You guys have different eyes for things, right? You see things differently. Mm -hmm. um, I have someone working with me now and she's behind me hiding, Monique. And what I said was next week I'm gone, I'm gonna be traveling. 
I'm going to have her go through my website and start looking at things with a critical eye from a different viewpoint, because I know what I wanted to say, but that doesn't always mean it's right. Like I want her to look at it and how can we verbally change it? Maybe the look and feel needs to be different. Is it a new uh, template? I think you guys bring a different like breath of fresh air, something, Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you are very digital. You guys want to know, like, how does it, I, you know, you want to know if it looks awesome on your phone. And that's great for guys like us, older guys. I, I'm 49. I've been in this a while. I, I feel I'm a, I am adapt pretty well and I try to stay very, very current because it helps my business and it helps me mentally. Um, mm-hmm. But I love your guys' perspective. You know, yeah. you look at things differently. You want to be treated differently. You have a different voice. Um, I was driving out of downtown Cherry Creek watching a procession of cars with some political flags honking and waving and cheering. And I won't get into who they were for, but I said to my wife, I'm like, this is the next generation of leaders voicing their opinion, which is just amazing. So I think you guys will bring that ability to shine. I think you'll bring that ability to look at things a little bit differently. Um, maybe, you know, maybe I'm a black and white kind of guy, but maybe you're more in the gray area with, with feelings and emotion. And I think that's super cool because it forces people to adapt. Yeah. Um, and I just, I think you're going to bring a beautiful eye to things and, and be okay with that. Be willing to spark that in people's minds and get them to think differently or, or more strategically about what they do. That was very well said. Yeah, he's a great speaker. Just um, for those people who are listening or watching this, uh, Chef Jason Morris, right in front of us, people, uh, very successful. He's a great chef, even better person. But there's a common theme in all of his words, and that's hard work. Uh, Mm -hmm. Life is hard, as we all know. And uh, in regards to this career path, it's hard work. And Chef Jason Morse, he's successful, everyone. And you can look him up on Google. You know, he, you could say he's a celebrity chef. I would. You know, he's awesome. But he, he still keeps that theme of hard work. He's still a hardworking individual. And he realizes that none of this was a fluke. You know, mm-hmm. oh, this was all hard work. And I think that's a great takeaway, for, especially for those listening, that, you know, this career and hospitality, the industry is going to take hard work and <clears throat> it's rewarding, you know? Yeah, just look at Chef Moore, Jason here, and I just hope people take that away today. Yeah, yeah you're so right. It is, it is a lot of hard work and it's calculated moves and it's calculated decisions. Um, I, I really think um, just, it's just, it, it's so it's fun, right? You have yeah. to have fun in what you do. You have to um, create your opportunities. You have to um, take advantage of those opportunities when they come. You know, people are like, oh, you're so lucky. I'm like, yes, I created luck for the last 25 years of my career. It's hard work. And, and you know, I'm 49. I'm still jamming. I'm still cramming. I'm still hustling. Um, you know, I, I have a saying, a little thing on my door. I love like catchy little things, right? I have this, I am an entrepreneur sign on my door and it's Mm -hmm. like, I take risk. I hustle. Uh, You know, I see opportunity. Um, I'm in love with what I do for work. Um, And it's just great because every day I look at that and I'm like that, that is why I do it. Like the drive, the excitement, the adrenaline rush. Um, And, and, you know, yeah, just like you said, it's a lot of hard work. Don't be afraid of it. Embrace it. Because the more you embrace that hard work, it just, it's, you know, like you guys are doing. I think you guys are doing an incredible job doing what you're doing because you're getting out of your comfort zone and you're interviewing uh, business professionals to really, you know, pull out of them some questions you may have about how to model your career and what path you want to go on. And this is going to make you better and you're going to learn to be able to turn this around and help make other people better. So, I mean, if you look at that, it, 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 when you talk about what you guys bring to the table, look at this. This is what you bring to the table. For the future leaders, what advice would you give them? Um, be true to yourself. I, I really think um, stay true to your core values. I am who I am. I don't change. I changed one time 
to fit the mold into something I never should have changed to do because it went against my morals, my ethics, my beliefs. Um, I was part of a group of uh, executive leaders uh, in a hotel conference center in Georgia that felt like if they picked on all the line level employees and managers behind closed doors, that made them feel better. Never once doing anything to try to actually make them better. Yeah. That is not how I roll. I should have spoken up. I should have stood up for them. I should have stood up for myself. And I didn't because again, I took a job with a high salary and I should have known there was something wrong. After I left that job, I said, you know what? I will always be true to myself. I will stand up for my beliefs. I will stand up for those around me. And it's not me. It is not me. I, it is we. We do this together. Stop with the, you know, I did this. I did that. I did this. I did that. It's a we. We is everyone that you interact with to get your job done. We is me, my wife who helps us, Monique who's sitting back there rocking it out, my uh, Spice Co-Packers, my Caramel Production guys, the Ace Hardware guys. There is a, if you think about it, the, the amount of effort it takes to put one bottle of spice on a shelf in a hardware store would blow your mind. But guess what? At the end of the day, I don't sit there like, oh, look what I did. Look what I did. No, we as a team succeeded. So stay true to yourself. Don't be afraid of hard work. Stand up for your values. Stand up for your beliefs. And never forget to recognize the team. This is a team effort. If you stand in front of your restaurant, continually taking, or your hotel or country club, wherever you're at, continually taking all the kudos and never delivering any of that to your team or bringing your team out to successfully take those kudos, they're going to hate you. They're going to resent you and it's going to be miserable. Hello, everybody. It's one of your hosts here, Nate Barrett. I just want to give you all a warm thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Pineapple Podcast starring Chef Jason Morse. Speaking of Chef Jason Morse, if you'd like to keep up to date with everything he's got going on, go to Chef Jason Morse on Instagram or 5280culinary.com on any web browser. If you'd like to get into those hot cocoa bombs or get to grilling with Chef Jason himself, go to the Ace Hardware YouTube channel, go to their playlist, and go to the Recipes with Chef Jason playlist. If you happen to want to keep up to date with everything the Pineapple Podcast has going on, go to Pineapple Podcast CCIC on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and YouTube. Again, that's Pineapple Podcast, CCIC on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and YouTube. Thank you all so much again, and we'll see you in the next episode.